So our next speaker is Vladimir Shalayev uh, from Purdue University. Uh, I have known Vladimir for a very, very long time. Well, not from the very beginning. His first degree is from the University of, uh, of Siberia. Uh, never been to Siberia. Uh, but uh, he did his first postdoctoral work at uh, University of Toronto, uh, working with uh, Moskowitz. Uh, since then, he's had a number of uh, positions. He spent a number of years at uh, the University of New Mexico. Uh, he then recently, New Mexico State? At New Mexico, I, I misspoke, I knew what it was. At New Mexico State University. Uh, then uh, recently he moved to Purdue University where he is the head of the nanophotonics uh, part of the nanofabrication facility, and he's a distinguished professor. Uh, I said I've known Vladimir for a long time. He and I have both been working on metamaterials since before there was the name metamaterials. So Vladimir and I were working on what we call composite nonlinear optical materials. Uh, you've probably heard both of us speak about this many times, that a composite material can have a chi-3 value larger than either of its constituent values. Uh, and uh, well, the field of metamaterials, I think, sort of grew out of, of some of these pioneering work, not just Vlad and me, but a number of people who were working on this a very long time before this really catchy name of metamaterials was invented. Okay, so Vladimir, please, please come up and give us your presentation. All right, thank you, Bob, for inviting here. Well, what is the biggest motivation for photonics? It's faster than electronics. Otherwise, we would do everything with electronics. I mean, it's so greatly developed technology. But we do need photonics to speed up things. Uh, if you're OK with uh, being diffraction limited, then basically there is no substitute for silicon-based nanophotonics, silicon, silicon nitride, spectacular work that Alex just reported, Mihal Lipson. And it's already used in computers and many lots of other devices. However, if you would like to do uh, photonics on really deeply nanoscale, let's say 10 nanometers or below, so you have to use different approaches. And that's where this uh, sexy fields of plasmonics with materials comes into the game, because with plasmonics, you could focus light down to nanoscale. So about six years ago, I asked myself, how come this field of plasmonics materials, I will use this interchangeably, with so many beautiful ideas ranging from clock and negative refractive index, there is no lack of nice, beautiful phenomena. How come there is no really application? So I think very few, if any, as opposed to electronics, when transistors and lasers came out, I mean, lots of lots of different applications. So what's the problem there? And so after some thinking on this, we realized that the biggest, at least in our opinion, problem is simple. It's the absence of right material platforms. Because nearly all demonstrations in the area of plasmonics, or let's say 10 nanometer scale photonics, done with silver and gold. And the small dirty truth that those materials have a number of problems. Uh, to begin with, they are not CMOS compatible. So and we started to look at new material platforms, and that's how I found myself doing lots of actually material science, engineering, and I just want to convince you there are really lots of exciting things in that area which could reshape the field of plasmonics, in, at least in my opinion. So uh, the things which I'm going to share with you today is about new classes of materials, and uh, we, they, they could be broadly called as like uh, plasmonic ceramics or transition metal nitride specifically, which we believe is a great substitute for gold. And transparent conducting oxides, uh, those materials are really fantastic for the telecom wavelengths, which arguably the only wavelengths which matters, or let's say that which matters most. And I illustrated with a number of applications that these new materials could really bring up, finally, uh, real-world applications ranging from um, energy conversion to uh, data storage to this nanophotonic circuitry. And uh, I also uh, tell uh, uh, what I believe almost like a new paradigm for nonlinear optics that I'm sure Bob and myself share lots of excitement about, because things really uh, get crazy there. 
And I fully agree with those who believe, as uh, Peter pointed out, that the next technology evolution is actually going to be quantum. I don't have any doubts about that. And in that regard, it's a good question to ask what plasmonics materials could offer to that uh, quantum technology of the future. And finally, I end up with metasurfaces, because it's not important only to, write, to use the right material platform, but also the right way to fabricate things. And if you could use this planet technology, which is so easy to make things, like chip compatible, basically, then uh, you, could really, you could really talk about these uh, real world applications. All right, so, and this work is done in really close collaboration with Alexandra Balta, so I should say she plays a major role here, just helping with uh, uh, using this new material platform for some devices. So, but uh, let's start with gold and silver, which used in 95% of all applications were well, all demonstration in the area of plasmonics and uh, photonics. What's actually, the, what is the problem there? Well, one is obvious, the high cost, and uh, the, optical, the optical problem is not adjustable. And of course, for really functional devices, you should be able to tune to switch the properties. And with plasma, with gold and silver, you have fixed plasma frequency, you have whatever you have, and you really cannot tune it. As I pointed out, they're not the most compatible. This is what people don't discuss much, but I think it's a very essential problem. I mean, the whole idea of plasmonics is to focus light down to nanoscale. But when you do that, you have elevated energy density, really high energy density, and uh, it's unavoidable the temperature uh, rises. It increases typically at least like, let's say, 400 Celsius. And if you're dealing with nanostructure, the truth is it's enough actually to destroy your structure. There is this creep phenomenon, there is diffusion, the change in shape, it changes the, uh, the, uh, the resonant properties. So there is no way to use nanostructure for durable applications. And that basically it contradicts the whole idea of plasmonics because we would like green light to down nanoscale. And they're not robust. So what we would like to have instead refractory, and refractory in the language of material scientists means uh, being able to sustain high temperature. It has nothing to do with refraction. Refractory means uh, high uh, materials that can sustain high temperature. We need refractory materials if you're serious about using uh, 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 it in plasmonics applications. We would like materials to be adjustable, tunable, uh, compatible with the existing uh, semiconductor industry and low cost. So there is a really challenge here to develop the right material platform and that's what we have been busy for the last six, seven years. So to put it in perspective, uh, well, I did it with my postdoc, this uh, high Gartner cycle curve, looking at the whole field of plasmonics. It's, uh, that's probably arguably true for any big technology. So it starts with some trigger, with some discovery. Then there is this exponential increase in terms of visibility, number of publications. Then quite often you face certain problem. You, uh, reach this peak of inflated expectations. And clearly in the case of plasmonic is the absence of the right material platform. Then there is uh, a loss of interest. Sometimes the technology just dies. And, uh, but if you find a solution, eventually you bring it to this slope of enlightenment and hopefully then to uh, real industrial applications. So let's, let's look at that in, uh, at the field of plasmonic in that regard. Well, one could argue that it started in 1857 by first demonstration by Michael Faraday, a uh, reproducible way making of nanostructured uh, gold to silver particles by using this reduction reaction. So we actually use the same way still to, to make these colloidal nanoparticles. That, uh, uh, one could say that the, the beginning of the whole plasmonics, of course, people didn't use that word at the time. So when we didn't have lasers, we used electron beams uh, to excite this plasma excitation. It was important. So surface enhanced Raman scattering dramatically enhanced uh, uh, Raman uh, signal, when, uh, which comes as actually it was Martin Moskowitz who first uh, brought this understanding into the game that this dramatic enhancement is largely because of high local field associated with the excitation of surface plasmas. And metamaterials, indeed, it's a brilliant idea that you actually could design and engineer your optical properties by properly changing the shape and the size of structures. And of course, people like Sir John Pendry uh, really did a uh, uh, seminal contribution to this area. Sensing, quite important, nanophotonic circuitry, which I already mentioned, uh, photovoltaics, nanoscale laser. So all beautiful, great developments, but then around this 2010, that's 
well, we studied and other groups studied to think, so we don't have really right material platforms. One thing is to demonstrate it in a lab, and another thing is to bring uh, to real world applications. But things are changing. So we now have developed a number of new families, actually, materials that uh, do not just as good job as uh, has been done so far with gold and silver, but in many cases, much better. And when you combine it with these new 2D materials that really enable this uh, switch in tunability, also compatible with uh, the uh, semiconductor industry, you really have lots of exciting applications. You do bring it to this uh, enlightenment period. And moreover, uh, these new materials also enable new things like photocatalysis, uh, actually a very exciting area, and also some application in the area of uh, quantum. And quantum is clearly now with the exponential increase, so that brings us back to this exponential increase. So things are good, at least the way I see it. So uh, let's uh, illustrate this, uh, uh, the importance of this uh, uh, being refractory for plasmonics. Okay, this is, uh, we place here different materials um, as a function of wavelengths at which they become plasmonic. In other words, the real part of dielectric permittivity becomes negative. If it's negative, you could excite the surface plasmons, and that's the way to confine light down to nanoscale. So that's critical. And in this axis, I'm showing the imaginary part, which characterizes losses. Uh, losses, by the way, not necessarily always detrimental. There are lots of applications which are due to losses, because because of these losses, you could actually do this nanoscale local heating, use it for photocatalysis, energy conversion. There are many good things, but in some other things, of course, it's detrimental. One way or another, you do need to know also the imaginary part of EPSA. And here I'm placing the bulk melting temperature. Of course, when you're dealing with nanostructures, uh, the temperature at which real uh, problem starts are much, much lower, as I pointed out, because of all this creep or diffusion. Uh, but anyway, it's proportional to this bulk melting temperature. And in that regard, of course, there are well-known refractory materials, such as tungsten. It's a great material. It could sustain uh, 3,000 and above Celsius. I'm speaking into, uh, about the bulk melting temperature or molybden. But in that regard, if you look at this... Uh, uh, transition metal nitrides, such as zirconium nitride and titanium nitride. Look, they are plasmonic. The epsilon becomes, the real part of uh, uh, the electric permittivity becomes negative indivisible. So they are plasmonic material. But they're also very, very much uh, uh, temperature stable. They're as refractory as tungsten is. So they take advantage of both worlds. And uh, this to be compared to silver and gold, which have very low uh, bulk uh, melting temperature. So it's uh, around... 1,000, but as I put it out, when you nanostructure it, problems start even at 350 Celsius. So that's the idea, to use this transition metal nitride, which would be refractory, can sustain high temperature, very robust materials, but also would be plasmonic. So and I illustrate the, uh, some applications of these materials in this listed area, energy conversion, uh, biomedical applications, data storage, and nanophotonic circuitry uh, that we're pursuing in our labs and other groups uh, also do lots of interesting work in this direction. So let's start with energy conversion. Um, of course, uh, photovoltaics, uh, I mean, it's, it's a great and an important thing. So you convert light uh, coming from the sun to, to electricity, to electron and holes. And so that's, uh, that's what photovoltaics is about. But we know that all the photons which are below the gap are wasted because, I mean, uh, they cannot be absorbed. Those which are way above the gap of the photovoltaic cell, they have pretty low conversion efficiency uh, because in this case you do lose energy to heat and some other degrees of freedom. So it's, uh, it's was shown, for example, for silicon, you have this uh, around 30% efficiency. Well, in reality, what you can buy, it's around 20% or so. And, uh, but on the other hand, it's well known, at least theoretically, that if you would do it in a different way, if you basically use heat and uh, then let this uh, object which is heated up to high temperature, let's say 1500 Celsius, to radiate the plant radiation, but control this radiation. And this plasmonics, you could control it in a very, uh, in a very great uh, degree. So basically, you could make it to emit light only the wavelength which matches exactly the band gap of your photovoltaic cell. That could dramatically increase the efficiency. And then you could basically use the heat. 
And uh, to get this heat, you could use either the sun, then it would be solid TPV, thermophotovoltaics, or you could use gas, oil, whatever. So it could be hybrid technology. So during the daytime, you could use sun. During the nighttime, you could use just simple fuel. So, and you just use the well-known property of plasmonics to control radiation. Uh, the challenge is, so that plasmonic should be able to operate at temperatures like 1200 Celsius. And of course, it cannot be done uh, with gold and silver. And having these materials like titanium nitride open up this uh, very interesting possibility. And I'm showing our work. Uh, uh, we are getting close to demonstrating the prototype, but at least we already showed uh, all key ingredients of this uh, thermophotovoltaics. So what we uh, did, we did uh, uh, this broadband absorber by making simple rectangular rings out of titanium nitride and out of gold, just for comparison. So when you do it out of gold, you heat it up up to 800 Celsius, that's what happens to gold. Of course, it's completely out of the game, and nothing happens to titanium nitride. And it does absorb almost independently of the angle of incidence and polarization in the whole uh, spectrum of the sun. So you could see that the absorption matches very well the sun spectrum, this red curve and black one. So in addition, you could design a meter just on the other side of your object, which you heat up up to high temperature. And the meter, this is our absorber, and the meter could be just simple, this rods of titanium nitride. What could be simpler? As opposed to another approach based on photonic crystal, which is a very uh, difficult and complex way, and it's hard to actually to preserve structures at high temperatures. So here you could see that it designed so that it emits the wavelength which matches very well uh, the band gap of gallium antimonide. So, and if you look at the, what kind of efficiency you should expect in this case, this is a, a Planck's radiation of a black body at 1500 Celsius. This is efficiency uh, of conversion for this gallium antimonide photo photovoltaic cell. And you see that only 22% matches uh, with a photovoltaic cell. So you lose lots of energy in this case. However, if you put this frequency selective emitter, that's what happens. Now it matches very well the, uh, the, uh, the area where this uh, conversion of uh, um, uh, energy into electricity is really high. So, and in this case, basically, you get the efficiency, which is 53%. So it's, and it's, it's just appreciate, it's a very simple structure, like 50 nanometer uh, uh, simple structure, which make this frequency selective emitter. And of course, the whole difference, there is no new idea here. It was well known and demonstrated for gold that you could make this frequency selective emitter, like Baja Wolny did, and other people. The only difference is material that can sustain high temperatures. And that makes uh, the whole difference uh, for these uh, potential TPV applications. So yet another area which, uh, well, uh, could be equally important, that has to do with data storage. Company like Seagate and other uh, Western Digital, they actually suggest quite for a while to increase the density of information it could place on the CD by simply using smaller, uh, smaller metallic grains. And uh, the thing is, if you have very small uh, magnetic grains, so it takes very high magnetic field to switch them because corrosivity is very high. So in the, what was suggested long ago, it's so-called heat-assisted uh, magnetic recording. Basically, if you heat it up locally, just one particular uh, magnetic grain, so then the corrosivity drops, and even with small magnetic field, you could flip it and record your bit of information. And you cool it down, and you keep that bit of information. So in the way to locally heat up is bring this near field transducer, uh, basically, it's non-antenna. Uh, you radiate it with light and you locally heat it up. And it could be, let's say, 20, 30 nanometer size uh, uh, of, the, of the bit. The challenge, though, that we are talking about elevated temperatures, around, three, around 400 Celsius at least, and when you make it uh, uh, antenna out of gold, uh, 400 Celsius, it cannot work at least in a durable way. So again, this uh, refractory plasmonic materials could make a difference. So arguably one of the most used so far applications of plasmonics is in the area of uh, uh, photothermal uh, therapy, biomedical applications. That was suggested and pursued by Naomi Hallas in Rice. So that's, the idea is actually very simple. If you take these uh, uh, plasmonic particles and somehow bring it to the cancerous tissue, there are many ways to do it by using ligands or some other means, that's not a problem. You bring that particles, to the area of cancerous tissue. Then you irradiate it at the wavelengths, uh, which is in the biological transparency window, 
and this is between 800 and 1100 nanometers, you excite these surface plasmons, you locally hit it up and destroy cancerous tissue, and it does work. The problem, though, that for gold colloidal particles, this plasmon resonance is outside of the biological transparency windows. It's like 540 nanometers. So therefore, they have to make these nanoshells. It's a dielectric core coated with gold. So as a result, yes, the resonance shifts to this biological transparency window, but your particle becomes large. It also uses gold, and there are also some surfactants. Then the problem becomes how to remove these particles from your body, because they tend to accumulate in liver and kidney. And if you look at, as an alternative, simple titanium nitride colloidal particles, not shells, no gem, no any structure, just simple colloidal particles made of titanium nitride. They absorb exactly in the biological transparency window. The absorption efficiency is as high as in gold, meaning that they as good plasmonic resonances as gold does, and there is no any structure, and they could be much smaller, like 50 nanometer in size. So I'm not speaking that it's simpler, cheaper, and all these things. The question is, could you make these colloidal particles in a similar way as like Michael Faraday did it since the first time in 1857? And the answer is yes, actually, you could make it very easily in a very cheap way. You just take titanium particles, titanium dioxide, which you could buy next for nothing uh, of any size, and you nitridize them in the atmosphere of ammonia. And the important advantage you get in this case, as opposed to gold, which are polycrystal, this turn, turn out to be, uh, turn out to be uh, single crystal colloidal particles. And since, of course, uh, uh, the lattice is cubic, the colloidal particles are cubic themselves, too. So it's a single crystal colloidal particles, and that has been proven by, by, by using this diffractogram, and it's a very cheap way to make them. So that yet another application of, uh, in this case, transition metal nitride for uh, photothermal therapy. And... Uh, I was speaking so far about these uh, plasmonic ceramics, which are kind of good replacement for gold in the visible part of the spectrum. And by the way, they're the most compatible. Ironically, titanium nitride is used in, uh, in a chip industry as a barrier uh, area with, to preclude uh, diffusion of copper. But it's, by itself, it's a very good plasmonic material. Of course, it needs to be optimized, but it's a good plasmonic material. Speaking of other important class of uh, uh, new, this new plasmonic materials, we're excited about these transparent conducting oxides. And there are several groups working in this area, at least some of them, and they, they really show spectacular properties. First of all, they're easy to make. You could really tune and switch their properties dramatically. Uh, by their non stoichiometric you could really uh, change their plasma frequency in a very broad spectral range by simply changing the condition of, uh, of making them. <laughs> and also, the, the way to make them is very cheap, and, so, and they show very, very unusual properties. And those properties, as I will point out, are, are getting really interesting at the point when uh, epsilon prime crosses zero. This is so-called E and Z point, epsilon near zero point. So that's uh, for this transparent conducting oxide. It happens around telecom wavelengths. And you could control it by simply, uh, for in the case, for example, aluminum doped zinc oxide, which we uh, like to work with, by simply changing the doping of aluminum. So, but you see it's around telecom. And if you look at the imaginary part, it's much less than a gold or silver. So they actually have smaller losses compared to gold and silver. And ASIO aluminum doped zinc oxide has the smallest epsilon double prime. So uh, why it's important? Because we uh, they provide absolutely unique opportunity uh, to switch. If you really work very closely to the point when epsilon near zero, it means that if you slightly increase epsilon, your material becomes dielectric. If you slightly decrease your uh, epsilon, it becomes metallic. You basically switch from metal to dielectric, uh, which is dramatic change in terms of the optical properties. So refractive index in this case could be changed 100% easily. And you do it very easily because you're sitting close to the point where epsilon near zero. And that's where all the properties, the wonderful properties come uh, from. And as I will show in a moment, you could do it in extremely ultra fast fashion, actually 100 fem per second response time. You dramatically change your properties. So this is, uh, that's why this material is so unique in terms of switching and using phonolinear optics, as I will show in a moment. Uh, Alex, you all may be, right? <laughs> So, and just to illustrate, for example, how these transition metal nitrides could be combined with uh, TCOs for switching for nonophotonic circuitry. Let me show uh, this, uh, this kind of 
uh, this slide. So first of all, for titanium nitride, I mean, plasmonics, one of yeah, the idea is to use this on, the, on this nanophotonic circuitry, to use them as an interconnect. And I should mention that uh, Pierre Berini is sitting here, actually did lots of pioneering work in this area. Uh, I would say, I keep saying this to uh, Volny, they are two leaders in these areas, but unfortunately they did perhaps too soon this type of work, when uh, perhaps we were not ready for to go this down to five, 10 nanometers in terms of nanophotonic surgery, but they, they, I mean, the ideas they brought up still valid, it's beautiful work. Anyway, so the first question to respond was, okay, uh, if I would like to make interconnect, basically waveguide, plasmonic waveguide out of titanium nitride, how it would be compared to gold? And it turns out with titanium nitride, we could make very easily epitaxial quality, single crystal quality. And you could see it, this is 10 nanometer thick. Uh, unfortunately, it may be not that easy to see, but it is really single crystal quality. It's basically almost defect free as opposed to gold. Gold, of course, is polycrystal. And we would demonstrate, in this case, we use so-called long-range surface plasma polyton propagation lengths approaching one centimeter, which is huge for these uh, nanophotonics. So, but the most important thing is to make a switch. So, and the idea is a very, very straightforward. If I put this aluminum doped zinc oxide on top of this interconnect waveguide, so of course the uh, propagating properties of this waveguide depends on the cladding, which in this case AZO. And with AZO, I could dramatically change optical properties, as I pointed out. Since I'm talking about 1.5 micron telecom, I actually could switch AZO almost like from metallic to the electric behavior, which means that my propagation through this waveguide could be on or off, and I could do it in a very fast way. So in this, uh, based on the results we measured here, you could see that actually we, we, we changed the refra reflection coefficient really like 40%. It's huge change, transmittance like 30%. And so the response time is uh, around 100 femtosecond. And so what we showed that in this case, actually modulation depths uh, would be, could be quite, quite good, 0.4 dB over micron, which is indeed a very impressive number and at very, slow, uh, at very low insertion loss. All right, this is the result which I think shows the beauty of this uh, ENZ materials. And the good thing about this is that uh, independently, two groups by, using, by working with entirely different materials, Bob's, uh, Bob Boyd's group uh, did ITO, and we did ASIO. By using very different techniques, they used, used Z-scan, we used palm probe technique. We both uh, obtained really dramatic, uh, dramatic change in uh, nonlinear response uh, at the NZ point. And it's, it comes down to really so basic formulas. Again, it's from a textbook, like if you go to the Bob's in a linear optics book, you see this formula that refractive index is linear refractive index plus this and two times intensity. So the thing which we not necessarily remember, but since I teach this course, I do. So this actually M2 is proportional to chi 3 of course, the uh, nonlinear response of third order, and it has this linear refractive index in the denominator. What it means, if I work close to the point where epsilon close to zero, and if the imaginary part is small, which is true for AZO and ITO, it's quite small, like 0.1, not exactly zero, but rather small. That means that the refractive index, linear refractive index is really small. So that nonlinear term actually could become larger than the linear one. And this is kind of unusual. The whole idea of this perturbation theory for nonlinear optics in this case uh, should be actually revisited. But more than that, you have this linear refractive index in the denominator. So therefore, when you look at the nonlinear response as a function of the wavelengths, so actually, the closer you to the point where epsilon closes to zero, the larger N2. And that's what we measured. You see, it has clear peak here at the point where epsilon goes to zero. Therefore, refractive index becomes smaller and smaller. So and this is just uh, beta 2. So and uh, you could also look at this uh, nonlinear term uh, delta N. And delta N actually, in this case, could be significantly larger than N0. So in our case, it's like 0.4. Of course, it depends on intensity. It's proportional to intensity, whereas linear refractive index is significantly smaller. So if we look at the ratio delta n over n, it's actually like uh, uh, five times larger. I mean, nonlinear term five times larger than linear one. So, but the whole idea that if you go close to zero, when you really could switch from metallic to uh, dielectric behavior in an ultra fast fashion, that's kind of uh, exciting. It's, it's an exciting paradigm for many nonlinear uh, phenomena, for switching particularly. So, uh, recently we looked in more detail on the 
type of nonlinear responses you could induce in these materials, aluminum doped zinc oxide. And it turns out that there are two different ways, two different important nonlinearities. In one case, you have this uh, interband excitation. This is my valence band, this is my conduction band, this is the Fermi level. In the case of interband excitations, you actually excite electrons from here to here. So uh, the band gap is 350 nanometers, we use 325 nanometers. So we basically increase the charge carrier density, which means we blue shift the plasma frequency. Because the larger the charge carrier density, the larger plasma frequency. Well, and uh, what happens uh, then, then of course there is relaxation, but the important thing here, uh, to, so that's how I'm showing the excitation. Uh, so the important thing that the, uh, this response is very fast, and that's due to so-called uh, Shockley-Reed Hall effect, when you have this uh, actually vacancy states, in our case it's oxygen states, it really uh, makes the recombination very fast uh, on the scale of 100 times per second. This is for the case of interbed excitation, but you could also do uh, int intraband excitation. So in this case, let's say we use it as a pump 800 nanometers, so you stay in the conduction band. So uh, it turns out that what, what happens in this case actually, because you increase the temperature of hot electrons, so uh, it's, there is this Fermi smearing, and as a result, increasing the effective mass, which means that your plasma frequency would be redshifted. So it works in a different direction, this nonlinear response. And it turns out to be also very fast, also on the scale of 100 times per second, which is indeed very important. So which opens up this possibility to really to control nonlinear response in a very interesting way if you could send, uh, let's say, two different pumps. One is UV, which would enable this interband transition. Another is uh, near infrared, 800 or so, which would enable this intraband nonlinear response. And by controlling the delay between these two pumps, we actually could control uh, the nonlinear response. And of course, you also could control delay between uh, prop and these two pumps. So that just shows these two pumps. One is UV above the band gap, another is near infrared, and this is our uh, prop, our signal, which is around telecom ENZ probe. So, and what we obtain for this interband excitations, as I already mentioned, uh, refle uh, reflection and transmission changes quite dramatically, and from this we could uh, deduce all this uh, N2, delta N, that's actually what we do by measuring this delta R and delta T. So it's, why it's quite significant, and because of this uh, defect states, the uh, relaxation is very fast, that's very important. When it comes down to intraband excitation, the story is a little bit different. In this case, uh, it also is very fast, and the question arises why it's so fast. It turns out that if you look at the uh, heat capacity of electrons and compare it with heat capacity of lattice, in the case of gold, it's 100 times less. I mean, uh, heat capacity of electrons as compared to that of lattice. In the case of titanium, it's 1,000 times less, which means if I would uh, heat my electrons up to some certain temperature, then the increase of temperature for lattice in the case of titanium nitride would be 10 times smaller than in the case of gold. And as a result, this very large dominant nonlinear response which related to lattice, which is slower, doesn't play as much role in titanium nitride as in the case of gold. And we, we see basically largely electronic response. That's why it's so fast, like 100 times per second. And we were able to fit very well this, uh, the experimental observation with the uh, theory which we actually use this calculation for density of states. And so uh, we calculated this electronic heat capacity and extracted this electron uh, lattice coupling. So and here is the possibility to engineer a linear response. That's really kind of interesting. So uh, first of all, with the blue line here, I'm showing when we have both pumps, uh, uh, UV pump and the near infrared pumps. And with this uh, purple, I'm colorblind, I believe it's purple. Yes, purple. Okay, so actually it's a result of when you do two uh, pumps uh, independently, either only uh, uh, 800 or only 325. And you see that simply algebraic sum fits very well to the case when you have two pumps, which means that these two contributions work, work independently. If you're interested why, I could suggest our qualitative explanation. But that means you could control your nonlinear response. So by changing the delay between these two pumps, you could have nonlinear response which looks like this, or like this, completely inverted. Uh, here you have like 60% change 
in transmittance from this point to this one, whereas here it's only like 12%, five times reduction. So you really have this possibility to control your non, to engineer control your nonlinear response. <coughs> so uh, this, uh, this symposium is largely about quantum, and I'd like to mention these new materials also could be uh, really of interest for, uh, for quantum application. I, I mentioned only one, although we work on many others as well, but uh, those are still in work. So one of the key things, ingredients uh, for this quantum photonics is actually single photon source, which we have been talking about already for a while. And so uh, people like, for that reason, uh, nitrogen vacancy, uh, because also in nitrogen vacancy, the coherence time for spin degree of freedom is really large, which means which you could use for qubit. So the relaxation type could be, let's say, 100 microseconds. So it's really long when you could do lots of operations. So, and uh, that's why uh, there is uh, this uh, large interest over this NV centers in diamonds. <laughs> and, uh, and another thing, you could do it all at room temperature. So if you look at the emission of NV centers in diamond, it's actually broadband. And you could use it as a single photon source, but the rate with which you generate single photons is actually not that high. So could you increase it? And for that, uh, of course, one of the ideas is to use antenna, as many groups use it's conventional to cell effect. Near the resonance, you have higher density of states, and therefore you have this increase, increase in the rate of uh, uh, emission of photons. But there is an uh, unorthodox approach, which is using ideas by my colleague Evgeny Narimanov and uh, uh, Zubin Jacob, the, who also moved to Purdue. So that uh, has to do with so-called hyperbolic materials. These are very interesting materials that, uh, that kind of have extreme anisotropy. They act as conductors in one direction, actually in two directions, x and y, and as a uh, dielectric in the vertical direction. And you could uh, accomplish this by making very thin layers of plasmonic materials, <laughs> metallic materials, and dielectric ones. And if thickness is much smaller than the wavelengths, you could average over size larger than the uh, thickness of a single layer, and you would get effective epsilon negative in an xy direction and positive in z direction. Why it's important? Then, because you, then if you look at the isofrequency surface in k-space, normally it's a sphere if, if your material is homogeneous and isotropic, or spheroid if it's uh, anisotropic material. But if one of the epsilon is negative, like in this case, in transverse direction, actually two are negative, one is positive, then it becomes hyperbolic. And that's why these materials are called hyperbolic. Why it's important? Because as opposed to sphere or spheroid, where it's, you have a closed surface, and therefore uh, the largest accessible wave vector is limited, here it's open surface. You have access to very large k's. And, large, and also it means that if you calculate the density of states, which is basically the volume of between these two either frequency surfaces, it's, it's, uh, it's divergent. It could be arbitrarily large. Of course, in the end, it's still limited by the size of this structural unit, but that could be much smaller than the wavelengths, hundreds of times smaller. And we actually developed these hyperbolic metamaterials made of our titanium nitride, which is a lattice match to dielectric layers, aluminum scandium nitride. And scandium was added here for purpose to match the lattice. So basically, we have 20 nanometers of titanium nitride, single crystal quality. Each layer is 5 nanometer thick. And 20 nanometers of aluminum scandium nitride, also single crystal quality, are 5 nanometer thick. So it's like one single super lattice. So, and sure enough, and so when you place nano diamond with NV centers, we choose the size so that uh, on average you have one single NV center in nano diamond. You see that significant increase in the rate with which spontaneous, with, with which these photons are emitted as compared to just a, a, a glass substrate. And to prove that we are dealing with single photons, we, of course, as everybody does, look at this G2 correlation function. And indeed, it shows this uh, large deep way below 0.5. This is just one single example how these materials, based on new plasmonic materials, which are CMOS compatible and really nice, could be used for quantum photonics applications. There are many other, we are looking at this, like quantum registers and so on. But if you're serious about bringing plasmonics and doing good stuff for quantum photonics, we should right now start thinking about the right material platform for quantum applications as well. And the count actually is quite respectable, half a million counts per second. All right, so and the last thing I'd like to mention in the end is this notion of metasurfaces. 
Uh, some argue that you know, maybe not that uh, many new ideas there, and perhaps it's true, but this particular area of metamaterials, I think, make any difference, because metamaterials with all this great notion of clocking, negative refraction, all the hype this field created. Unfortunately, there was almost no real devices demonstrated. And metasurfaces already demonstrated almost like all basic elements which break the records in terms of the size. It really opens up the possibility for these flat optics, ultra-thin optics. And of course, as always happens, there are lots of early work in this area done by Iris Hassman from Technion, for example, Philip Lalan, and, uh, but Federica Capasa, I should say, uh, made a difference with his pragmatic uh, technology-driven uh, approach when he demonstrated really lots of devices uh, using this uh, notion of metasurfaces. So, I mean, the idea is really straightforward. Normally, when we look at the way light is refracted and interfaced, so the longitudinal component of momentum should be conserved. As a result, if the refractive index is higher, the light bends toward the normal, the Snell's law. So, but that, of course, assumes that uh, there is no phase gradient along the interface. If I place tiny antennas, uh, which could be much smaller than the wavelengths on the interface, and each antenna couples to light and shift the phase abruptly because of this uh, coupling, and uh, the shift would depend on the position because antennas are different. So I would introduce the gradient of phase. But gradient of phase means momentum. So to conserve the momentum of photo, now we have to take into account the momentum introduced by these antennas. And as a result, you modify the Snell's law. You have this additional term, gradient of phase, which could be as large as any other terms in this equation. So you have this possibility to really to design and engineer uh, the way light uh, goes through interface between materials. That's, I mean, the very simple, straightforward idea, basically well known for, let's say, for the microwave range, microwave antennas, but somehow, well, uh, never was employed, was employed in the full measure in the optics. So Bob did, oh, sorry, Bob, uh, uh, Federica did it for uh, uh, mid-infrared, so we followed up and did it for, tele, for telecom wavelengths. And to give you the idea, the size of antenna is 30 nanometer thick, 50 nanometer the size of the uh, arm, where is the operational wavelengths at 1.5 micron. And sure enough, we obtained this uh, anomalous refraction, which depends on the uh, type of antennas we use. You could send the beam in any direction you want. So, and as just Alex said, there is nothing more important. All this light is all about phase. I fully agree with this. If you can control over, the, if you have control over the phase, you could do anything with light. So now for this particular case, basically, if I would like to make a lens, each antennas, which I make by simple, by using focus ion beam, uh, million, so shift the phase. And I need to just solve this inverse problem, how much I should uh, shift the phase so that the constructive interference, let's say, would be 2.5 micron away from my lens. It's a very simple problem. And then you have this lens, which actually could be, uh, which actually world record thin lens. It's in this case, 30 nanometer thin uh, lens. So, but you could do anything. Uh, and there are many, many work done by many groups. I, by no means, I'm trying to pretend that we did the most important work. So I list some of them but it's just to illustrate. So of course you may also can make a hologram, so by controlling the shift of face in every single point, you could actually create image whatever you want at any distance. <coughs> so you, because you control the face, you actually have full control over light. Here's just overview what we did in our group. I mean, I guess it's excusable bias because that's what we did. Uh, although again, there are many other uh, spectacular work done by other groups as well. You could make Huygens surface. What the difference, what, what this Huygens surface is about, that you control not only the coupling to the electrical field component, but also to the magnetic one. And for that, you add to this dipole antennas, also magnetic dipole antennas. And if you do so, you could match the impedance because you control mu as well. <laughs> and if you match impedance, you actually could get rid of reflection. So one of, arguably one of the most important devices in optics which used the most broadly is actually CD spectrometer. When it comes down to biomedical applications, that's what they do all the time. They need to distinguish between different molecules with different chirality. And for that, they just measure the difference in absorption between left and right circular polarized light. <coughs> it's kind of a complicated experiment. I mean, time consuming, bulky. So by using the uh, photonic spin hole effect, we design a single ray, like 100 nanometer thick, a CD spectrometer. If you send simple uh, light light on this, the left circular polarized light goes to the left, 
right circularly polarized light goes to the right, and different wavelengths go in different directions. It's that, that simple, and it's a very important device, CD spectrometer. You could make out of dielectric if you would like to make losses smaller. I'm sure in our work, but there are many other works, including Philippe Lalanne, actually, uh, earlier than others, uh, when Philippe uh, using dielectric lenses. <coughs> you could make color hologram. You can make a cavity smaller than the wavelengths. The basic <coughs> idea be behind cavity feedback system, a light a wave front after one round trip should restore itself. And for that, the smallest size is lambda over two, as we know. But if I have antennas here, which introduce additional shift of phase, I could restore the phase front, even if the size of cavity is smaller than the wavelengths. And we actually now uh, have already preliminary results that cavity only 50 nanometer in size uh, works as a regular cavity. <laughs> you could man make broadband optical rotator, rotate to any wavelengths by controlling the phase shift between uh, left and right circular polarized light. You could make active metasurfaces by adding gain, uh, a gain layer, or you, you could do nonlinear optics. <laughs> you also could dramatically change the optics properties of antenna. Normally, if you place antenna on a substrate uh, with large refractive index, most of light actually goes to the substrate. However, if you put it in E and Z, have some near zero materials, because of a huge impedance mismatch, all the light goes up. So, and there's also very interesting pinning effect. It turns out that you could completely change the properties, the, the, the way antenna radiates by using this meta surfaces. And in all cases, we are talking about uh, optical elements which 50, 100 nanometer thick, or even less sometimes. So it's really ultra thin flat optics. That's what the beauty of this. <clears throat> and I'd like to end up with yet another notion which I think the broadened the scope of uh, meta surfaces, and uh, we kind of like it. <coughs> As I pointed out, this why meta surfaces they are so cool because you break the uh, photon momentum conservation by introducing additional momentum associated with these antennas, but the energy is still conserved; frequency doesn't change. What if I also break the energy photon energy conservation? That actually would uh, brings into the game yet another very important element, which we could make all these meta surface based devices even more exciting. So we are talking about shift of frequencies, almost like Doppler-like shift. So if you send, let's say, light, red light on metasurface, and you modulate in time uh, the properties of this uh, metasurface, then uh, let's say it would be shifted, Doppler shifted, let's say it becomes green. And if you send it back, uh, it actually it would not go in the same direction, it would go in another direction, because in this case, your system becomes non-reciprocal, which is very important for, for optical isolators. So let me explain, explain the idea. <laughs> this is conventional meta surface. This is either frequency surface. When light goes to this interface, because of this additional momentum coming from meta surface, it doesn't go in the specular direction, but goes in this direction. However, if it will send it back, it would go in the same direction. And now if I also modulate my phase in time, not only in spaces here, but also in time, uh, modulation in time or phase means uh, frequency shift. So it means that when it goes to this meta surface, it goes from this size of frequency surface to this one. And if I sent it back, it experiences again shift in frequency and would go to yet another size of frequency surface, which means it would be non-reciprocal behavior. So you could also look at this like conventional refraction. Uh, you could treat it as a, a space refraction. And what we are talking about is time refraction. In conventional case, when light goes through the interface between two uh, materials with N1 and N2, so uh, of course frequency should be conserved and the momentum changes uh, in the code with the dispersion relation. If you do it in the time domain, if I now change refractive index in the time domain, what happens, uh, wave vector should be conserved, but frequency changes in the code with the dispersion relation. So it's Basically, space and time complementary, we know this. And it kind of makes it cool and broaden the scope of use these meta surfaces. So to show that it can be done in the optical range, of course it could be done in the microwave range by using MAPS and so on. But in the optical range, by using these transparent conducting oxides, we already showed that, <coughs> like in this, basically, we sent pump and look at the uh, at signal, uh, the peak of the signal, the spectral position of the peak, uh, as a function of delay. And you could see that we see quite dramatic shift uh, on, on the scale of 15 to 20 nanometers. Actually, to understand this, you should look at this dispersion relation. And since I'm pointing out for this time refraction, 
uh, wave vector is conserved, it means that the frequency will change as much as the plasma frequency changes. And as I pointed out, for transparent conducting oxide, you could change the plasma frequency quite dramatically if you look at the ENZ point. So our calculation show it's actually 135 nanometers. However, since our layer is relatively thin and light spans only there are 20 femtosecond, and to develop this shift, it takes 100 to 150 femtosecond. The shift we observe is on the scale of 50 to 20 nanometers. Clearly still enough to obtain all this very interesting effect. So I'm almost done. We spent our sabbatical, uh, part of our sabbatical uh, in Harvard uh, just brainstorming with Federico Capasso what actually you could do with all these metasurfaces. <coughs> and I list up this uh, uh, applications, which I think are very important and reshape the, uh, the applications of plasmonics and uh, uh, metamaterials. So specifically, we're, we're talking about this flat wearable optics, which would include reconfigurable lenses, dynamic holograms, beam steering, novel light sources, dynamic signal routing, ultra-fast active devices. You, with new materials, you could use them for harsh environment sensors, like titanium nitride could sustain very high temperature. Wearables, goggles, augmented reality wearable sensors, and ultra-fast space-time light modulators. So very exciting, in my opinion. So to sum up, uh, I, my take-home message that uh, plasmonics, materials, nanophotonics, meaning 10 nanometer scale nanophotonics, are material fields, and it's time to deliver. And I think the uh, bottleneck actually is actually material platforms. And I think we have tremendous progress here by bringing into the game these refractory plasmonic materials, which are as good as gold is, but have many, many advantages because you can tune, switch their properties. And transparent conducting oxides, uh, where you could really have dramatic tunability, switchability, you could do it optically and electrically. Uh, that enables uh, very important optics at uh, telecommunication wavelengths. I also pointed out that's very interesting uh, phenomena which you could obtain uh, at the point close to, uh, when an epsilon is close to zero. So we are looking at all possibilities how these new materials and plasmonics based on new materials could be used for quantum photonics, where, as I pointed out, the future, and that's where the next technology evolution is going to happen. And with the surface designs, I think finally we have something coming from the field of metamaterials, which really bring up devices almost like every month's uh, basis, this ultra-thin flat uh, metasurface. So that's people I work in close collaboration with Alexandra, so that people who did all this work and some related publication. Thank you. So, Vlad, thank you uh, very much for such a fascinating talk, and we are open for questions. So, uh, I'm sure that you know about Gus Hanklin and Ipper Kudder of oh. Space Shift as yeah. well. So, if you go with the linear uh, 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 sequel polarization, do you see a shift? Uh, similar to what you have it in the, in the, in the I would say, the electric material, or do you, see, do you enhance these kind of shifts? Well, the, the, the luxury we have in this case, this shift is really by no way small. It's huge. I mean, I could change the reflection going in this direction to this direction. I mean, dramatic. And it completely control. I design and engineer that. So that gives you really uh, lots of degrees of freedom in designing uh, your devices, and that's a, that's a big advantage. And we are talking about antennas which are 100 times smaller than the wavelengths, and you have this fantastic control over phases. It's all about control of phases, and because of this, antennas shift phase dramatically when they couple to light. So I have all this luxury. So with conventional metasurface, I do it in space domain, and the latest development, we do it in time domain. That's broadened the scope of this. But again, it's fully controlled uh, uh, shift of phase. That's pretty, I mean, you could do this pulse shaping. I mean, you really could do anything with this. And we are talking about ultra-thin flat optical optics. Uh, my question was that, can you enhance the... Oh, it's, it's, a good, it's a very good idea. I, I certainly you should be able to. Uh, frankly, we have not looked at this. Yes, that's a very good point. Could I enhance it? Yeah, because that also eventually comes down to this momentum thing, and I could control it. Yes, it certainly can be enhanced. It's a good point. Uh, the bottom right corner one, if I look at that equation, it tells you if N1 goes very small, so it seems like omega 1, so one of those omega, omega 1 over omega 2 times, 
Say the gate what? Uh, if n1 goes small. If n1 <laughs> goes small. Right, right. Omega 1 over omega 2 diverges in some, uh, from your equation. Well, yeah, and, that's and, interesting and, observation. Uh, but then there's the question. But I thought that's what you were talking about in the immediate and next slides, but you had a shift of wavelength by, which was limited by, you said the response time of the material. Actually, um, what you said, I mean, like going to really uh, n equal to zero, that's interesting in terms of what you pointed out. Uh, the, the thing which I tried to emphasize, that the shift of frequency, delta omega, it's actually uh, proportional to the change in refractive index. And at the E and Z point, I changed the refractive index significantly because I close to zero. And therefore, the shift of frequency doesn't have to be, let's say, one hundredth of percent. So I show it already, it's like, well, percent. Uh, but in principle, we hope to bring it like tenths percent. And that's a lot for the optics, particularly if I use a cavity. Because with cavity, I could separate modes very uh, nicely. So uh, honestly, I think that's really important. Arguably, again, what is one of the most important devices? Special light modulator, but it's slow. Here, I could do it really fast. So it would be like space and time light modulator. So for that, we need the right materials. And I think TCOs could do the job because uh, the change in the, refract in, the, in the refractive index is large and the result change in frequency is large. And of course, it's proportional to change. Interesting talk, Vlad. I enjoyed it. I'm sure everyone enjoyed it. Now, you talked a lot about the very nice properties that these alternative materials have, these refractory materials. Let's take, for example, titanium nitride. Now, um, how about some of the limitations that these materials might have? For instance, how about what? some of the li limitations that they may have. For instance, limitations. Uh, limitations. limitations. OK. So for instance, uh, how about, uh, I see, from what I noticed, you didn't talk about so much about the thermal conductivity of those materials. Now, the thermal conductivity of titanium nitride is around 20 watt per uh, micro Kelvin. That of gold or silver is 20 times better. It's around 400. And it also seems to be to have higher losses. So titanium nitride compared with silver or gold. Now, we, we heard from the talk of uh, Alex that the single most important problem that uh, nanoelectronics has is the generation of heat. This is the reason why, since 2002, the speed of clocks hasn't been improving. So on one hand, it seems that these alternative materials, like titanium nitride, seem to give rise to higher local heat. On the other hand, if you want to use it for high power, uh, like heat-assisted magnetic recording, as you mentioned, then in light of the fact that there you require extremely high field intensities, and the heat, uh, the thermal conductivities of these alternative materials is smaller, it might lead to uh, temperatures, working temperatures, operating temperatures that might be even higher than the high, already very high melting point of titanium nitride, which I think might be the reason why Seagate, you mentioned Seagate in your talk, might be the, re might be the reason that commercial companies at the moment are using gold or silver instead of this. So I would like, if you could comment on this, on, on the thermal. Uh, on one hand, they seem to give rise to higher local temperatures. On the other hand, if you want to use it for really high power, they might lead to operations which might be even above the already high melting points. So I don't know if you have some. Something. Well, it's all valuable comments, and I don't want to leave you with the impression that titanium nitride solves all the problems. So first of all, there is titanium nitride, there is titanium nitride. So the one we're working with, it's at the axial quality, and heat conductivity is actually higher than if you would do like conventional titanium nitride, which is a polycrystalline structure. So it could be actually not as high as in gold, but pretty high. Still, the problem of uh, removing heat, like in the Hammer applications, is important. But for that, there's much better solution there is. You just put some overcoat layer which could significantly incre uh, increase the uh, remo heat removal. Again, there are many things to respond here, but this is a new material. Plasmonic-wise, epsilon double prime in titanium nitride, in the best titanium nitride, is as small as in gold. And epsilon prime completely controlled. So, and it's single crystal quality. And other things like you mentioned, like uh, heat, uh, that you need to remove the uh, heat. I would say it's certainly not as good as gold, but very close if it's epitaxial. But to solve this problem, the easiest way, when we already showed it, it's very thin layer of silicon nitride, and you dramatically increase this heat removal. But in principle, you're right, and there is, of course, there is no thing that would fit all sizes. But that's a lot of new opportunities here.
Because with gold, you're immediately stuck. It's not the most compatible, and 400 Celsius destroys it, no matter what. Here, yes, there are challenges, but they can be solved. Like oxidation, for example. It turns out that you could place a protection layer and completely resistant to oxidation. And we already showed this. So, but that's a well-viewed comment, yes. And, but we're not naive. We're looking at this uh, uh, other things to, to take care of to make it real device. And what you mentioned is one of those. You're absolutely right. So I'm afraid we have to stop the discussion now for many reasons, including the fact that there's food at the back of the room. But as the next step, let's uh, thank uh, Vlad for a, just an exceptional talk. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's, it's, it's been a pleasure to have you.